Welcome everybody. I'm Mary Kulloff, the President of the Royal Society of Tasmania, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Today we're meeting on the country of the First Nations of Lutruwita, Tasmania. The Royal Society of Tasmania acknowledges with deep respect the traditional owners of this land and the ongoing custodianship of the Aboriginal people of Tasmania. The Society pays respects to elders past and present. We acknowledge that Tasmanian Aboriginal people have survived severe and unjust impacts resulting from invasion and dispossession of their country. As an, de as an institution dedicated to the advancement of knowledge, the Royal Society of Tasmania recognises Aboriginal cultural knowledge and practices and seeks to respect and honour these traditions and the deep understanding they represent. Now, our speaker today is Associate Professor Rebecca Carey. Rebecca is a former Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow, and those of you in the science world will know how rare and hard to get those are. Tasmanian Tall Poppy Scientist of the Year and the 2020 winner of the Australian Academy of Science Dorothy Hill Medal. Rebecca is interested in volcanic processes and environments, geological hazards, and indigenous cultural narratives around volcanic events. She leads the volcanology group at the University of Tasmania, which includes two postdoctoral researchers, five PhD students, and other students at honours and undergraduate levels. Rebecca's current projects range from microanalytical studies of products from single eruptions to volcanology and geochemistry of hotspot volcanoes offshore Australia and the role of mantle plume volcanism in tectonics, as well as field studies of ancient mineralised volcanic terrains in Australia. So whether you're an expert geologist or not, and I know that we have some with us today, we're in for a treat today. Rebecca's, Rebecca's talk title today is Volcanic Eruptions in the Deep Submarine Environment. Are the dynamics and products the same as on land? Please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Too would like to pay my deep respects to the traditional owners of country, the Palawa people. Uh, thank you very much to the Royal Society um, for inviting me to present my research to you today. And thank you also, Mary, for that delightful introduction. So today I'd like to share with you the last decade of my career, which has been focused on submarine eruptions. And today I'm going to be specifically comparing and contrasting eruption dynamics and products between submarine eruptions and their on-land equivalents. So eruptions on land are spectacular events for the public and scientists alike. And I'm sure most of you will agree with me. This is a picture from an eruption that's currently taking place on La Palma Island in the Canary Islands. Now, as a volcanologist on the ground here, we can see in exceptional detail what's going on. We can see that there are numerous vents. We can see the eruption dynamics of those vents. We can also see the fountain heights and whether eruption plumes of the material are being produced. And then we can also measure the rates at which those, that material is being produced and how lavas are being emplaced. So we've almost got a minute by minute observational database to understand the dynamics of this eruption. Now this volcano is heavily monitored, earthquakes, gas, volcanic gases, as well as satellite imagery. So if we couple our minute by minute observational database, with our monitoring data, which is you know, nanoseconds essentially, then we can not only constrain what's happening on the ground, we can constrain how that magma is coming from depth in magma reservoirs, being channeled up to the surface, up until the point at which here, the magma, magma is being fragmented and disrupted. So the coupling of the monitoring and the observations really allow us to understand fundamentally how these eruptions work. We observe and measure these explosive processes 
And we also um, collect the material that's being erupted. Here, I'm just showing some pumice class from on-land explosive eruptions. So if we can constrain what's happening at the vent and we collect the material, we can study that material to tell us more about what the magma was doing prior to its disruption. And if we have those constraints, then we can use quite sophisticated numerical and experimental models to help us understand magma's transit from the deep earth to the shallow earth. We not only make these types of measurements and observations for explosive eruptions, we do the same thing for lava emplacement too. So this was the 2018 eruption of uh, the East Rift Zone of Kilauea. And here we can see a runny type of magma, which we call basalt, um, that is being emplaced as a lava on the ground. And there's a USGS scientist who's sampling that material to tell us what the magma characteristics or the lava characteristics are. So with so many explosive eruptions and, a few, and lava forming eruptions happening uh, today, or at least on an annual basis, we really understand quite a lot about their dynamics. The powerful events, the powerful explosive events are much more rare. We typically only get a few of those per century. This is the 1980, May 18, a powerful eruption of Mount St. Helens. Uh, and so this was really a, a, a turning point in volcanology. This was the first real observationally rich uh, eruption that we were able to um, constrain with monitoring equipment as well. Since 1980, the 1991 Pinatubo eruption in, in the Philippines was also equally as powerfully explosive. And it's these eruptions that I have focused my career on, at least until I went across into submarine volcanism. So these are kind of my passion. It's what I've, I've, it's what I've studied the most um, so far. And they're the eruptions that really fill me with awe. I'm not the only one who's been stunned and filled with awe for these powerful explosive events. Pliny the, El Pliny the Elder perished in the 79 AD eruption of Vesuvius. And 20, I think 26 years later, his uh, nephew, Pliny the Younger, wrote to Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, with a narrative about how he saw this eruption happening at the time, about 79 AD at Vesuvius. And in this letter, he describes the dynamics of that powerful event. So I'll just read that out to you. And this is the first written description of a powerful eruption like this that we call a Plinian eruption, named after Pliny the Younger. So about one in the afternoon, my mother pointed out a cloud with an odd size and appearance that had just formed. From that distance, it was not clear which mountain the cloud was rising, although it was found afterwards to be Vesuvius. The cloud could be best described as more like an umbrella pine than any other tree because it rose high up in a kind of trunk and then divided into branches. I imagine that this was because the, it was thrust up by the initial blast until its power weakened and it was left unsupported and spread out sideways under its own weight. Sometimes it looked light coloured, sometimes it looked mottled and dirty within, with the earth and ash that it, it had carried up. Now, scientifically, that written description is actually quite accurate, which is, um, which is really interesting. So these are eruptions that we call Plinian eruptions. This was documented 79 AD. So we've had about two millennia of documented explosive and, effuse and lava forming eruptions on land. In contrast, we, the, the first submarine eruption that was observed was only 15 years ago. And it was a volcano called Northwest Rota, which is in the square just below here. And this is a volcano at about 550 metres below sea level. And this was a serendipitous discovery. The ROV was working in the area and discovered this event. Sorry, the remotely operated vehicle, the robot that was on the seafloor um, discovered this event. So I'll just show you some of the footage from this remotely operated vehicle. The vehicle is doing science on the seafloor and it's tethered to the ship. 
So the scientists on the ship get to see exactly what the ROV gets to see. And the ROV ha also has manipulator claws in which it can sample the products. So this is what they saw. So what we can see here is that there's a small cone and that the explosive dynamics are really pulsatory and transient. As soon as that gas is um, erupted with those clasps, they get ejected into the water and they come down close to the vent. The gases are very sulfurous and they're also, there's, there's both magmatic gas like sulfur gas, uh, for example, rotten egg type gas, as well as steam that is condensing. So I wish I had the audio for this video from the control van, which the scientists were sitting when they were watching this. And the audio of the van is just filled with, wow, awesome, wow, wow. It's just incredible because this was the first time that a submarine eruption had been seen. How lucky were they to be on the ship watching the first ever eruption on the, on the sea floor. So these events are also as spectacular. And when we observed this event, it was really a, a, a turning point in which uh, we started to be, become, a, become more interested in a, as a community in the eruption dynamics of these seafloor events. So that event was very weak. It was very, um, uh, had a very low intensity. And that event was also um, accompanied by, I think, lava emplacement. And those types of eruptions um, are, are the most common type of seafloor eruption on Earth. And they occur along what we call mid-ocean ridges, which are where two tectonic plates are pulling apart. And as they pull apart, they leave space for magma to come from the deep Earth to the shallow Earth. Now, these mid-ocean ridges are absolutely gigantic submarine volcanic chains, and they're they're characterized by these weak explosions and lava emplacement. But there are also places on the earth where plates are coming together, tectonic plates coming together. And in those locations on land, we see that in that we see that sticky magmas, what we call silicic magmas, silica rich magmas are formed. And on land where we get sticky magmas formed, we also get those powerful explosive Plinian eruptions. So I've highlighted some areas on this map, which are submarine plate margins where we have this convergence. And there we expect sticky magmas and perhaps powerful explosive eruptions. I'm gonna focus now on a place close to home, not New Zealand and, the, and north of New Zealand, which is one of these com, um, convergent um, plate margins. So this is the North Island of New Zealand. And in this satellite bathymetry topography of the seafloor, we can also see that north of New Zealand is a chain of submarine volcanoes. And on the North Island of New Zealand, there are volcanoes that have produced these powerful Plinian eruptions. And typically these eruptions come from what we call caldera volcanoes. So some of you may have been to New Zealand. This is the Taupo volcano, which is on the North Island. A lot of you might be thinking, this doesn't really look like a volcano. It doesn't have that classical Mount Fuji type shape. And that's because its past eruptions have been so powerful that the magma that's erupted has left a void space and the mountain has kind of collapsed in on itself. So the power of these events is just phenomenal. So Taupo is one of these caldera volcanoes, about 40 kilometers in length, uh, 10 kilometers uh, wide. Another one of these caldera volcanoes is Rotorua. So, so in this convergent plate margin, uh, what do we expect these submarine chains of volcanoes to look like? Are there any caldera volcanoes there? Well, if you're a sailing in the Pacific Ocean on that, above that submarine chain, this is what you would see. There's no manifestation of those submarine volcanoes on the sea surface. We need ships and we need robotic vehicles to go down there and study them. Well, in New Zealand, it is a relatively well-studied 
area. And so um, those sh some ships that have been there have collected topography maps of the seafloor. And those maps um, have helped to understand what the nature or architecture is of that environment. But we, we have fundamental questions about submarine volcanoes because we can't see them. Even, address, even very simplistic questions like, are there caldera volcanoes on the seafloor? Do they look the same as on land? Do they also erupt in powerful Plinian fashion? Are their eruption dynamics the same? Do they erupt similar products? These are really basic fundamental questions, some of which we are not able to answer. Ships that have been in this area have documented at least what these caldera volcanoes look like. So this is the Brothers Vol Caldera Volcano, this is the Havre Caldera Volcano, and this is the Macaulay Caldera Volcano. So that last sort of two decades of ship-based research has demonstrated or answered the first two questions specific to this tectonic environment. Yes, there are caldera volcanoes in this region, and yes, they look the same as on land. But those other regions where plates are coming together, they're less well characterised and understood. In, um, in 2012, there was, an ex there was an eruption of one of these submarine uh, volcanoes, Havra volcano. A lady was in a commercial airline jet flying, I think from um, one of the Pacific Islands to Auckland. And she looked out of her window and she thought she saw an oil slick. She thought maybe it's a pumice raft, but it looks a bit like an oil slick. When I get to Auckland, I'll ring GNS, Geological Nuclear Sciences in New Zealand and tell them what I've seen. So she did that. And then they used a series of satellite images to see if it was an oil slick or if it was something else. This is probably the best satellite image that was collected of that, those eruptive products. So this is a satellite image with a scale of about 40 kilometers. You can see uh, in this image that there's a steam plume that's coming from a point source. You can also see that there's a raft of porous pumice, similar to the pumice I showed earlier in the presentation, and that this pumice raft was submerged in the water column as well. This, this volcano had been mapped in 2002. So when they found this point source in this pumice raft, they were able to essentially locate it and, and show that Havra probably was responsible for this pumice raft. With the satellite imagery, we're able to know, we're able to determine that this pumice raft formed over about 21 hours, and its volume was about 1.2 cubic kilometers. So that's about um, 1,100 mcg volumes. So in terms of volume, this was equivalent to one of those powerful Plinian eruptions on land. And because we have volume and duration, we're able to constrain the eruption rate of the pumice which was 1 million kilograms per second, also equivalent to those powerful events on land. So for the first time, we had documented evidence of a very powerful eruption that had happened in this submarine setting. We published this data in an EOS article uh, and deter determining that it was the largest historic silicic sticky magma submarine eruption. The other part of this paper included a comparison of the 2002 topographical map with a post-eruption topographical map that was collected by a ship a few weeks after the eruption. And because we had the before and after maps, we were able to determine what was new, what was lost. And so these features in red and yellow are essentially the new volcanic constructs on that deep submarine caldera. But that, those discoveries, although they were phenomenal in their own right and really exciting, not just by us, but the whole scientific community, it wasn't enough to really address those fundamental questions about how submarine eruptions work. 
But the community was excited enough about this event that we co collected a group of scientists together, wrote some funding applications, and we got a ship-based survey with robotic vehicles to get to this volcano three years later. We tried for a rapid response cruise, it wasn't possible. We had to wait three years for all the turning wheels, all the ducks to be aligned before we could actually get to the volcano to study what was on the seafloor. Getting this ship-based science done is not trivial. This voyage cost about $3.5 million. It required um, 12 remotely operated vehicle operators, five autonomous vehicle operators, I think there are probably about 16 people that operated the ship and then there were 17 scientists. So that's what we needed to coordinate in terms to get the science done. So this is the ship-based survey of Havra Caldera after the eruption. And we can see these new features, this feature on the northeastern side, these features on the northern, on that side. Uh, and these new features down here. But the ship-based bathymetry, the topography, it's not high enough resolution for us to know what's down there. So we got this little vehicle called the Autonomous Vehicle Sentry, and we programmed it to go down to the seafloor and essentially map this volcano at high resolution. And what it does, it, it goes down to the seafloor, it kind of mows the lawn, kind of goes back and forth, back and forth, and then when it's run out of battery, it comes back or well, slightly before it runs out of battery, comes back. And then we grab it, we download the data, we um, power it up, and then we send it back. And we have to do that 12 times in order for it to produce this ultra high resolution map. And from this high resolution map, we can exactly see and interpret what these features are. And we'll go into that in the next few slides. So this was unprecedented high resolution of volcano scale eruptive products. Because we had this high, high resolution map, we were able to show where the vents were and what the depths of those vents were. We were also able to constrain the volumes and the morphologies of these new products on the seafloor. So the AUV map, the autonomous vehicle map, is kind of our platform, our framework for understand, understanding the Plinian scale eruptive products that are on the seafloor. Now in this next image, it's a 3D image, and it's a view from this side of the caldera, looking up towards this large feature at the top left. So this is the 3D rendered map of this submarine caldera. And I've put the fish in place to remind you that there is a kilometre of water above this volcano. This um, map, uh, this, although this map is such high resolution and we can interpret what these features are, we still can't really get to the nitty gritty fundamental questions we want to answer. Are these dynamics and products the same as on land? To do that, we need field-based geology, boots on the ground, looking at the products and mapping those. So that's when we use the ROV JSON to go down there and look at those deposits and sample them. So the ROV Jason, it is tethered to the ship by fiber optic cable and we sit on the ship with TVs and we watch what the ROV is seeing with its cameras. And we also ask the robotic operators to sample this or go there or do that. And so the ROV was really important because now we had an observational database to go with our um, AUV high resolution sentry map. So we use the manipulator claws to sample these giant, these um, pumice clasts. We used a vacuum type thing to suck up or slurp up some volcanic ash. And then we also use these push, push claws to sample stratigraphically through these ashy sandy type deposits. So with those two robots doing our work essentially for us, we can now, we now have the whole overarching framework to really address those dynamics of whether submarine eruptions are, the, are similar or different to their on land equivalents. But we also have to operate in, in uh, consideration of theory. So if you've ever snorkeled, 
when you're snorkeling on the surface of the ocean, there's no sort of pressure exerted on you. But when you dive down to look at something, then you do start to feel pressure. And that pressure is driven by the overlying water column on top of you. It's the weight of that overlying co column, water column, that drives higher pressure. So often on these ships, we take polystyrene cups with us, we decorate them and we send them down to the seafloor. And because of that high pressure environment, they shrink to kind of thimble size. So it's the greater density of water that drives high pressures at depth. So we have to um, work with that theory when we're answering these questions. On land, it's the gas bubbles in magma that drive explosive eruptions. In submarine settings, with this consideration of pressure, that pressure will suppress the growth of bubbles. And potentially, a hypothesis is, pressure also suppresses the explosive potential of eruptions. The other theory that we have to work within, this is just two of maybe 10, <laughs> these are the two most important ones, is that water is more conductive than air, which means that if lava is um, getting being placed in water, it's going to cool 20 times more rapidly than it would in air. So for submarine lavas, is that a major consideration? Are we going to see differences in morphologies or volumes of those submarine lavas because of these rapid cooling dynamics? This is a group out of Syracuse who have this big experimental apparatus where they're doing experiments in placing um, lavas to, um, into water on top of ice or in months. And what they do is they melt rocks in their furnace and then they deliver that magma into those watery or ice type environments. Now, when that lava was um, delivered into that bath, you can see that steam's being produced. That water is rapidly um, increasing its temperature and boiling. So that essentially means that the heat is being extracted really rapidly from that hot lava. And these type of experiments are also really important in terms of addressing those questions. They add to our understanding. So this is the results kind of section of the presentation. This is a high resolution uh, map from the AUV Century map, just showing you those eruptive products on one side of the caldera. And what you can see here uh, uh, in orange, these are lava piles or what we call lava domes. Those piles are forming over the vent. And in green, what we have are narrow um, ridges and wide lobes of submarine lavas. This is a high resolution image of what we call dome OP. And just for scale, that dome or that lava pile is four rest points high. It's absolutely massive. It's about 265 meters high. So the AUV century revealed, together with the ROV observations, revealed that there are 15 vents that erupted lava domes or lava flows. Um, and the question then we were able to address is, well, are these submarine silicic lavas from these sticky magmas, are they the same or different to on, to on land equivalents? So in this slide, I'm going to be comparing some of those submarine lavas to some on land equivalents of the same sticky type magma from the Cascades Volcanic Range, which is in the Northwest of the US. And we're going to be making the comparisons with respect to all these different parameters, dimensions, volumes, the aspect ratio, the, the height to the, the width of the lava, surface textures of the lavas and their overall morphologies. So this is submarine Havra Lava A, and this lava was erupted at 1300 metres depth, so really, really high pressure. And what we determined was that the lava morphologies were not different, were, sorry, were similar, pretty much exactly similar to some analogues from Mount St. Helens in um, Washington um, of the US. 
We then compared um, a different lava, Lava K, in terms of another analogue, South Sister Lava, and we found that they are exactly the same in terms of all those parameters. And then we compared the Havra Lava A wide lobe, shown here, with the Newbury Lava. Import importantly, these kinds of like ripples or folds on the lava surface. And we also found that they were exactly similar. So the implication is that the, although these lavas were erupted at high pressure and were rapidly cooled in water, they look the same as on land equivalents. Another question we were interested in is, well, if everything's the same about these lavas between subaerial, sorry, on land and submarine settings, is there any difference in where these vents were located on the caldera itself? And we see at Havra that these vents are located on structures. They're, they're sort of, um, they're found on, line, on structures, so they're all aligned. And there are, there are three structures or segments of which these vents are aligned. And that alignment is probably driven by faults on the volcano. But when we look at on-land equivalents, for example, Tarawera volcano, the 1315 eruption, which formed lava piles and domes, we see that vents are also aligned. And for the um, Chilean example, Coron in 2008, we also see that those structures are found on calderas. So there's nothing unusual about where these vents were on this submarine caldera. So to summarize, at this point in time, with the science we've done so far, we can see no difference between submarine silicic sticky magmas and their lava emplacement with on land equivalents. And that was really the, the first time that it's been shown for these type of magmas in deep marine environments. The other thing, I'm going to be going back a lot to this AUV map because it's just so gorgeous. But the other thing we could see in this AUV map, in addition to those lavas here, which we just talked about, is this rough dotted terrain. And when we got this map back, we were like, what is this rough dotted terrain? We need the ROV to do some sort of transect over this um, morphology to see exactly what it is. In the, oh, sorry. in the next image, I'm going to be showing another of those 3D images from the perspective of if we were standing on the bottom of the caldera floor, looking up at 600 meter high cliffs of this, um, of this caldera. And so that's essentially what it looks like. We've got the caldera wall here, the caldera floor here. And this dotted terrain, this rough dotted terrain is not only found on the caldera floor, but it's also found up here on the caldera wall. So what is it? What are these big, Blob, blobs or blocks. Well, the ROV observations identified these things straight away. They are pumice clasts. So porous pumice clasts, similar to what I've shown you um, previously. But they're not just normal pumice clasts. Uh, they are giant pumice clasts. This one here is the size of an SUV. And the largest one we saw was nine meters in length. In the next slide, I'll show you a movie from the ROV showing you what this terrain or this blanket of giant pumice looked like. So this is the ROV footage. The field of view is about six meters and we're gliding about one or two meters off the sea floor. What we can see here is this blanket of giant pumice class that are probably on average a metre in um, diameter. Some of, which, some of them are quite large. For example, the one we're going over now is probably two metres in diameter. And this blanket is formed by giant pumice class that are stacked three or four classes high uh, with a blanket, a little thin blanket of ash or volcanic sand on top of them. The one we're going over right now is the size of a, a little um, Morris Minor. So some of these are absolutely um, huge. Now, um, we sampled some of these giant pumice class, and this is an example of what they look like. Um, they're quite high porosity class. So all of all, the pumice itself has lots of pore space. Pumice is found on land. So finding it on the seafloor wasn't a surprise. 
the pumice on the seafloor looks internally exactly the same as pumice on land. But what is different is on land, we don't see blankets of giant pumice clasps. And so the implication is, well, maybe water pressure actually did have a role in the formation of these giant pumice clasped deposits or, or blankets. The AUV map, we're able to use and study a bit more, and we could see that there's kind of like a footprint or a dispersal area of these giant pumice clasps, which is defined by um, these blue lines here. Rough, rough terrain is where giant pumice is found. Smooth terrain is where there's no giant pumice. And the interesting thing is that this footprint is aligned northwest southeast which mirrors the dispersal of the pumice raft. The pumice raft was also oriented in that direction. Our ROV observations have mapped this deposit and shown that the vent for this giant pumice deposit and presumably the raft is beneath this lava pile uh, right, right here. So we think water pressure had a role in the formation of these giant pumice clasts. And the obvious question now is, well, are these giant pumice clasts and the raft related to an explosive eruption, or is this some form of, of lava forming eruption too? So just as a reminder, if this eruption had happened on land, it would have been a Plinian powerful event with a 20 kilometer high eruption plume. But on land, we didn't know what the dynamics was, were. So what I'm gonna show you here is some of the quantitative numerical modeling that we did to try and use all of our breadth of quantitative constraints and visual constraints to, that we've inserted into a numerical model to understand how magma got from depth up to the seafloor and disrupted to form the pumice raft and the giant pumice. So um, on these graphs, the y-axis here is depth below the vent. So the vent is at zero nine megapascals of pressure, 900 metres below sea level. On the x-axis is pressure. So magmas at depth are under high pressure. And as they come to the surface, they experience lower and lower and lower and lower pressures. On the right-hand side, the graph is again, depth below the vent on the y-axis. But on the x-axis, the scale is different. It's what's called the strain, the strain rate critical strain rate ratio. And essentially, it's a proxy for understanding when magmas will go from being a ductile fluid, when deformed, it, duct, it deforms ductally, a liquid, to a brittle, it, the magma will break up brittly. And a good analogy is blue tack. When we stretch blue tack, it deforms, if we stretch it slowly, it deforms like, a, like, like um, in a ductile fashion. It's very sort of plastic. But if we strain the blue tack really rapidly, it doesn't deform in a plastic fluid way. It has to snap. And the same thing kind of happens with magnets. So this strain rate critical rate, when it reaches one, we expect that the magma is being strained at such fast rates through magma acceleration that it has to undergo disruption or fragmentation. It has to go from a liquid to a solid. And these numbers on the graph here, three meters, 21 meters and 33 meters, are our modeled vent diameters. We don't know the vent diameter. But regardless of how we tweak all these parameters, we can't get the hover magma at this vent depth to explode, to explode or disrupt in a very powerful way. So the model that we've come up with is that magma at Havra actually got to the surface before it disrupted. It didn't break up before it got to the seafloor. And as it disrupted, it quenched, um, it quenched quickly because it was erupted into water. And that formed pumice clasts to then be released into the water column. Some of these pumice clasts made it into the raft and some of them came back down, they were, maybe they were waterlogged and came back down to form that blanket of giant pumice clasps. And this is what our numerical models are telling us. So the Havre 2012 eruption at this vent was not explosive. We can now 
we have now determined that water pressure suppressed the explosivity of this event, such that instead of a powerful explosive eruption, the magma got to the seafloor and disrupted in a less powerful way. The other thing we recognized with our model is that the pyroclast transport dynamics are very different. On land, when we have eruption plumes, as soon as we form the umbrella cloud, big clasts will fall out proximal or close to the vent. And with distance away from the vent, smaller and smaller clasts fall out. And the end result is that the deposit on the ground is very organized. Big class close to vent, little class far away from vent. Well, in a submarine setting, those transport dynamics are very different. The transport history of those pumice clasts here essentially was defined by a competition between how fast it could get to the pumice raft, because if it could get there, then it could float, and how fast it was waterlogging. Our models show us it took five or so minutes for pumice class to rise a kilometre to that sea surface. Some of them got to the raft and some of them waterlogged too quickly and fell to the seafloor. So the end result here is that we have demonstrated a case where eruption into water strongly modifies the transport history of these clasts. So these pumice raft, um, so in our model, our quantitative constraints show us that actually 75% of the erupted mass went into the raft. It's, and the, it's not on the volcano anymore. It went into the raft and then was dispersed in the ocean. Well, where did the raft go? We use satellite images to understand the transport directions of this raft. So here, here in, on the 16th, or 18th of July, when the pumice raft was being formed, it had this type of dispersal. But over the next three weeks, you can see that the pumice raft sort of migrated around the eruption site. We see, we see it, um, we saw it off Fiji. This is the pumice raft here. And then eventually three years later, that pumice came to Tasmanian beaches. The implication here is that without seeing the raft, the record of this powerful event is actually not on the volcano, it's missing. So to summarize, what was the role for, of water for this eruption? Now we know through our study of this event that submarine sticky lavas look exactly the same at Havre as they do on land. Now we know that vent locations on submarine caldera walls, at least at Havre, aren't unusual. And now we know that submarine pumice class look internally exactly the same as their on-land on equivalents. For the, for the first time, we've been able to show that for these silicic magmas, water pressure um, suppressed explosivity at these significant depths. In the, in the atmosphere, this eruption would have been an explosive one with a high plume. We know that water pressure likely led to this unique blanket of giant sized pumice clasts. And we also know now that the record of the powerful nature of this eruption is actually not on the volcano, it, it went into the raft. So are we missing this record at other submarine calderas? So the thing I accidentally on purpose forgot to tell you was the lady who discovered the pumice raft out of the aircraft, she discovered that three weeks after the eruption. Our monitoring equipment was not sufficient for us to detect that eruption when it was happening. So one of the challenges of submarine volcanism is that in order to make these fundamental discoveries, we need to know that the eruptions are happening. We need to be able to respond rapidly to those. So we need more monitoring infrastructure in the ocean basins. We also need the infrastructure to be available to us to respond to these events. Okay, so lastly, I'd just like to say that um, this was a, really a team-based scientific effort. In fact, a lot of what I've presented today wasn't my own led research, it was research of other researchers and PhD students. So I'd like to acknowledge those and thank you again for inviting me to present today. Rebecca, thanks very much for that marvellous talk. I'm sure there'll be some questions. And for the people joining us via Zoom, if you would like to, to type in your question on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, we'll be able to relay some of those to Rebecca to answer. Mm -hmm. 
So questions from the floor, and we have a we have a roving mic, but so this is uh, the first time we're using this today. Mm -hmm. So there'll just be a small delay while we get that microphone to the person. Can I ask just three questions? Yes, Professor Lucas, please do. The first would be uh, a scientific one. How do you explain those waves, the wave formation that we saw the pumice, the pumice on the volcano? Uh, secondly, what's the relationship, if any, uh, between the volcanoes and the earthquakes that occur in New Zealand? And thirdly, what would happen in the summer and what would be in the New Yeah, okay. So I, the waves that you're talking about, are they in this in this area? Mm. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So fortunately for us, we have the expert here who <laughs> has studied these waves in significant detail, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll have a go. Um, no, it's a really, it's been very observant that we mm. pick up the, um, we call them wrinkles, but essentially, uh, Beth, if you want to just point out a last thing. Yep, that one there. Yeah, that lava um, kind of bulldozed its way across what was soft sediment on the floor of the caldera. And that soft sediment, soft sediment responded by forming a series of folds in the surface. So it's essentially a, um, a sim lava deformation of the caldera floor sediment. Okay, so the second question was related to earthquake activity at this margin. Uh, the earthquake activity is in this margin because it's a convergent tectonic setting where you've got the Australian plate and the Pacific plate converging. There are, um, that's what's formed the chain of volcanoes along that region. And that convergence triggers tectonic earthquakes as that Pacific plate is kind of like bull, bulldozing or pushing itself down into the Earth's interior. But where magmas are breaking rocks as they're rising through the crust, they're called volcano tectonic earthquakes. And we also see those at this margin. There are a few islands in this, in this chain of submarine uh, volcanoes. And on those islands, there are seismometers but there isn't the, um, the density of those instruments to really, um, to really um, characterize that earthquake activity in detail. So for example, after we saw the pumice raft and we saw it with the satellite imagery, we then went back through the earthquake record and we were like, well, actually there has been four earthquake events around Havre, not on it, around it, that were magnitude five or greater. So if we'd had more seismom a denser seismometer network, maybe we would have actually predicted or, or not predicted, monitored that event. And the last thing was about the ROV. So these ROVs are expensive pieces of kit. The ROV Jason is probably worth about six, oh, I think they took about $16 million of, of build and, um, and time, salary time to build the ROV, um, Jason. And I know just through talking to colleagues that it was a little bit worrisome when blocks of these giant lava pieces fell on the ROV. I know that that was quite worrisome, but I think they were, they were in so much awe that they just didn't care. But at least the scientists, right? The scientists didn't care. Maybe the ROV operators were a bit more nervous. What about something in science? Yeah, so there are um, submarines that, that operate on the seafloor down to six kilometres. The Japanese have one, the Americans have one. Uh, and uh, yeah, the thing about the submarine, I've been in a submarine to about a kilometre's depth. And the thing about the submarine is it's only the people in the submarine that get to see the, the action. Because that, that footage isn't broadcast on the ship. Whereas if you have a remotely operated vehicle, it's telemetered directly to the ship. So instead of having three pe people's opinions of what should happen, there's you know, a science party of 17 and potentially more on shore that can offer their advice and suggestions. 
I mean, that works well if you're all friends and happy to take on people's opinions. <laughs> it probably doesn't work so well if you're, if you're a bit more um, focused, a bit more okay. dedicated. From online, yeah? Yep. From uh, Paul Lennox, actually. Um, he says, uh, it appears the layering around the Harvard volcano is tilting away from the center of the hollowed out region. This is due to explosive disruption from pre volcanic predicament. Hmm. I'm not sure exactly what feature is being described. Can you repeat? Oh, right, the outward slope. Yeah, I haven't showed, a, I haven't in this presentation, I haven't shown a larger scale map of the actual full volcanic edifice, but it's kind of similar to Rule Pehu volcano in size and, and height and dimension. The interesting thing on Havra is that there are these waves on the flank of Havra. And where these have been seen on other volcanoes, they have been interpreted as big sediment waves from highly explosive um, laterally flowing pumice bearing currents down the flank of the volcano. Uh, we have not yet We've been so busy with the 2012 event that we've sort of overlooked what the eruptive history of this volcano is, although we do have samples for it. So I think an important thing we need to do next is really understand when was the caldera forming event for this volcano? And hopefully we've sampled that event in the caldera. Thank you, um, Ross. If you just wait a minute for the mic. Thank you. Professor Ross Large. Very interesting talk. I'm wondering, um, with the, the ongoing Permian eruptions, the very powerful ones, are there any examples of submarine eruptions that are so powerful that they breach the, uh, the ocean surface and, and they throw a vector? Uh, into the air beyond beyond the uh, surface, so they can be viewed on the surface because they're so powerful. Yeah, the event that comes to mind is from Colombo volcano, which is part of Santorini um, Caldera volcano. So that's in the Mediterranean, and that eruption took place in 1650. It was accompanied by such violent earthquakes. Uh, that the, there was significant damage from the earthquakes. I think about 2,000 people died. And the current hypothesis for that eruption is that because it was so shallow, it could actually erupt in that powerful explosive fashion. And as that jet of material was coming up through the water column, it displaced water. And that water displacement then led to tsunamis, which they think were in excess of 30 metres high. So they also have fatalities recorded associated with the tsunami phase of that eruptive event. The Colombo volcano is in relatively shallow water, I think just a few hundreds of metres. And so at least for, that mag for those magma conditions, that pressure of the overlying water wasn't enough to suppress the explosivity. It was still, it seems, equally as, as violent as it could have been on land. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. We have time for one last question. Someone joining us via Zoom? Uh, yeah. Two questions. Um, usually you can wait for lavas with these flows, and are the flows essentially flying over the surface or are they flying to the lava sheet? Mm. Yes, so the lavas at Havre are so sticky, or what we call viscous, that they haven't formed pillow lavas. Pillow lavas are typically associated with the more runny magmas. So no pillow lavas here. Pillow lavas are pretty much ubiquitous at those mid-ocean ridge settings where tectonic plates are pulling apart. There we see lots of pillow lavas and other um, features such as lava tubes or sheet lavas, similar things that we see on land. Pillow lavas are diagnostic though of a watery eruption environment. Yeah. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Now you heard a moment ago from our Vice President, Professor Jocelyn McPhee, who is a volcanologist herself. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask Jocelyn to come forward and propose a vote of thanks. So I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to have this opportunity to, where should I stand? Yeah, that's good. Yep, to, um, to offer a vote of thanks to Rebecca. I've known Rebecca for probably 21, 22 years because she was an undergraduate student at UTAS where I was lecturing. And she stood out from a very early stage of her undergraduate um years in a way that most undergraduates don't stand out and i remember one particular reason why um, i noticed rebecca and it was when she was in second year i don't know if you remember this rebecca but she came to my office and usually if second year students come to your office there's one of two reasons and that is they either want an extension for the assignment or they want to know the answers to the assignment. Now, Rebecca wasn't in either of those categories, and I recognised her, but, you know, second-year students are a bit of a blur. Um, I knew she was one of the students, and so she had the good sense to tell me what her name was. And she, she stepped in and she said, I'm Rebecca Carey, and I'm going to be a volcanologist. And that was a totally unique experience in my many years of, uh, of lecturing to have somebody who knew exactly where they were headed. And so it all happened um, as we've seen. And anyway, so that was a very long winded beginning. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for um, a terrific talk. Of course, you can't really go wrong when you're talking about volcanoes. Um, that's a, a very smart move. Thanks a lot for all your effort. Um, and we've just got a small gift for you Thank to you. remember the event. And I believe um, there's a, a membership form in there, Com complimentary, complimentary membership <laughs> form, just the beginning perhaps. Yep. Um, and so if we could all join and, and thank Rebecca. I don't have an opportunity to say any last words if you would like to. Uh, yes, I'll be sure to fill out this membership application as soon as possible, Joss. Uh, yeah, just a, a thank you from me for not only inviting me to present my research, but all the work that the Royal Society does to promote academic endeavours in Tasmania and elsewhere. So thank you for all your hard work too.